Hello everybody and welcome back to World of Warships Legends. My name is Spartan Elite 43 and tonight we have our very first look at the tier 6 premium destroyer for the Russians, the Ognavoy. So let's check this thing out. Oh, wrong button. We are running Vladimir Trubetskoy. We have both Eric Bay and Jersey Swirsky in there as our inspirations. We have contact is imminent for a little bit more torpedo speed. We have look at me now. We are using twist and track and we are using smoke on the water with our unstoppable legendary wood. Now, if we go to the ship itself, you'll see that we've got aiming systems mod one. We've got propulsion mod on there and we have the concealment system mod for that extra um, concealment. Now, we are running the upgraded torpedoes, which gives you quintuple launchers instead of three launchers. So uh, you'll see. If you take this off, you get uh, triple launchers rather than quintuple launchers. And the triple launchers reload much faster. They reload in 55 seconds with our current setup, whereas the uh, quintuple launchers reload in a minute and a half. I want to say it's a minute and a half. But uh, personally, I prefer the quintuple launchers. I'll go over why here in a moment. But uh, as you can see, we've got two smoke generators, two engine boosts. We are running our uh, flag, the community contributors, and we have our camo, or the permanent camo. Survivability, 16,100 hit points. Uh, artillery, we have 130 millimeter guns. It's got four of them, which is just two turrets, one at the front, one at the rear and they reach out to 10.8 kilometers reload time in five seconds they take 15.7 seconds 180 degree turn time uh, they are slow but it's manageable you can you can get over it you'll see a little bit of how slow they are in the match when we get into it uh he shell damage 1900 with an eight percent chance to set fire ap shell damage of 2500 uh, torpedo launchers Again, we are running the quintuple tubes. They're 533 millimeters. Reload time is just over a minute and a half. Um, one minute, 32 seconds. Six second, 180 degree turn time for the torps. Uh, 15,100 maximum damage. The 1.1 kilometer torp detectability. So they are nice and sneaky. Torpedo range of 10 kilometers, which is nice. Uh, this, I believe, is the furthest range on a Russian destroyer. So uh, that's that's the big selling point for this. So you actually get a Russian destroyer with all the perks that it has, and then you get the uh, torpedo range as well. Uh, torpedo speed, though, because we increased it, is 60 knots, but it normally is like 55, 56 knots. Uh, so keep that in mind. Maximum speed is 37 knots. Turning circle is 610 meters, and the rudder shift time is 4.8. Uh, concealment. I've got it down to 5.2 with our uh, our build. And the reason I do that is because I like to play aggressive, which means getting up close and personal, catching destroyers off guard, which is why we've got the twist and track going. And that allows us to get much closer and potentially catch people off guard. And it uh, does pretty well. 5.2 is not perfect. I would love it to be down to the 4.7, but you know, you gotta deal with what you got. And it is, it is very good at 5.2. Uh, otherwise it's like 6.2 or 6.5 something like that it's ridiculous so you definitely want to run some concealment on this thing if you want to use it as a destroyer if you're out there firing and you want to dodge the entire game that's up to you but that's not the way i play i like to play sneaky i like to engage and disengage when i want to okay uh detectability while firing in smoke is 2.8 kilometers so it's not bad Overview. Sure shot. Shells with good ballistic trajectory maintain velocity, making aiming easier. This is, you know, pretty usual for the Russians. Uh, they're very flat trajectories, meaning you hit the target pretty easily. You don't have to give as much lead as you normally would. Tough above average HP rating. I don't know if it's above average. It's right there at average, I think. I know the Germans have much more. Um, the Americans are right there, too. It's a big, it's a big destroyer. It's got more hit points than the Japanese. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, nimble aim, above average main battery traverse speed gives an edge. Are you? F Come on! How are you gonna completely? Are you really? Really? We going there? Really? Sometimes I wonder, like wargaming, when you come up with these little tags, like, do you actually look at the ship? <laughs> no, this is not nimble aim. Sorry, it's not a thing. Fletcher, nimble aim. This, no, 
<laughs> this ship now you can adjust that like i know you can actually make the the aiming better i used to do it with the uh, other russian destroyers when i was trying to go up that line haven't got there but you know what i'm saying i know that you can change that but i'm just saying that stock it does not have nimble aim <laughs> The Ognavoy, this ship was developed from the Nevni class destroyers with an increased displacement. Unlike her predecessor, she carried more sophisticated main guns placed in twin mounts. But like I said, you only get two of them. Now, there, she entered service in 1945, and there were 30 of them in the series. But you see, you got one twin turret at the front. You got your quintuple launchers, which is an interesting look, too. I like how they stacked them. You got three across the bottom, two on top. I like that. Um, and then, of course, you've got the... Uh, one double turret at the back. But, uh, yeah. I, this ship exists, and we'll get into more of it in the, uh, the video. So, without further ado, let's get to the gameplay. Alrighty, so we're going to be on Sleeping Giant, and we're going to have a domination match. So, uh, I gotta go over a couple things that I feel with this ship so far. Uh, it's not a bad ship, and it's not a good ship. It's kind of like perfectly adequate. You can do whatever you need to do in this ship. So, I don't know how it's going to fit in with everybody, but personally, I don't like it or hate it. Is that a bad thing? I'll let you guys decide. But, <laughs> but I will say this. It's a free premium ship that you can get by grinding out a, a uh, challenge. So I like that aspect of it, even if the challenge that they're making it really grindy. But I mean, you guys got to think about it. Premium ships, they, they offer more than just, you know, being a ship, okay? You get them for free, there's a big bonus there. Uh, the extra XP that they earn, the extra silver that they earn, all that stuff. So premium ships come at a premium. And when they, anytime you can pick one up for free, I highly recommend it. Um, now, obviously, there are a lot of us who just don't play the game enough to really be able to grind these ships out, and that's why they have free, uh, the premium ships that you can buy. Uh, those are for the rest of us. <laughs> those of us who don't want to spend 20 hours a day gaming in the same game over and over again, playing the exact same game mode. Which, by the way, I see, I read you guys loud and clear. You guys stood up and, and let me know, uh, even if you didn't say anything about it, that you guys aren't that interested in the Rust and Rumble videos. Um, so we won't be doing any more videos of the Rust and Rumble. It is a fun game type, and it, it's a fun little distraction from the regular grind of World of Warships, so I enjoy that. Uh, also, I'm back home. If you guys haven't figured it out, I am back home finally after spending the week at my sister's. Uh, oh, my God, there's an Atlanta B, and we're already in radar range. This isn't good. <laughs> Immediately, I get on the comms. I'm like, guys, I need help. We need to get this Atlanta out of here now. And so, uh, yeah, I get spotted because there are uh, Akatsuki's here as well. And this is the absolutely worst case scenario for me is that this Atlanta is right here. Now, luckily, this Atlanta doesn't do what he should do, which is absolutely ruin me and the Fletcher that are right here. There is a Fletcher right next to me. And this Atlanta is so preoccupied with shooting at either the cruiser or the battleship that we are actually able to sit here and just tee off on him. So you've got a Fletcher, you've got me, you got the Akatsuki actually shooting at me, which is annoying. So we're going to go ahead and shoot at him, even though we had armor piercing loaded for the Atlanta. Uh, we shoot at him just to kind of get his attention, get him back off. And then we swing back around. Now this is where you're going to see the guns kind of struggling to get back around. Anytime you have to do a 180 in this ship, you're going to regret life choices. Because the uh, front gun's going to take forever to get turned. So keep that in mind. Now the, the Atlanta opens up the angle and this makes him absolutely juicy for citadels. And we do actually punch it with two citadels right there, showcasing just how effective this can be against cruisers that give up the broadside. Uh, just like any other um, destroyer that has decent armor piercing like the Fletchers, uh, the Germans, you cannot sleep on these destroyers in a cruiser. If you give up the broadside of your ship, they can punish you, okay? And this is no no different. But uh, the one thing I will say is that this this ship, because it has two twin turrets as your only guns, you're going to be, anytime you're engaged, you're going to get a turret knocked out, and that goes half your hit, half of your, your gun. You know what I'm saying? So that is the one downside. Now, we knew that the Akatsuki was still hanging out due to the fact that we still had him on the uh, RDF or RPF, whichever way you want to call it. It can be either. 
radio detection or radio direction finding or radio position finding. It's the same thing. Okay, so keep that in mind. We're using twist and track. We know where he's at. He's now lit up. He's firing at us. He's doing a lot of damage. And again, this is a large destroyer, so it's very easy for him to hit. Uh, but as long as we we try to minimize our cross section to him, and we can we can dodge back and forth a little bit, getting the guns on target, keeping the guns cycling, and you'll see that his health just melts between us and our teammates shooting at him. He had no chance. And now because of our positioning, we're able to get into A. Our teammate is in B. We're capturing. We've already got C, and their their only base that they have is D. So they've lost an Akatsuki, they've lost an Atlanta. Uh, that was their only radar cruiser. The only other cruiser that they have is a Prince Eugen that's off in the distance. And so, being a domination, we capture the base. And then we're gonna be poking around trying to figure out where we can be effective from here. Because once you get this situation, they cannot possibly take these bases back from us. We've got our whole team in a perfect position. Our guys are moving up. It's just a matter of time before the game is over at this point the enemy has already lost. Uh, it'll be up to our team to not just throw the, the game out right. And this is gonna be one of the downsides of the ship that I'm gonna be focusing on. One of the upsides is obviously that the torpedo launchers. Um, if you go with the triple launchers, which I, I kind of did some rough estimates on how many torpedoes you would be able to, to shoot um, with the triple launchers versus the quadruple or the quintuple launchers during the match and it's roughly identical it's it's almost no difference whatsoever um, if you look at quantity of torpedoes during a match so keep that in mind however there are times where I have gotten into engagements and been like 15 seconds out from getting torpedoes uh, with the quintuple launchers where I would have already been loaded with the triple launchers so I think that that's gonna be a little bit of a uh, juggle if you like triple launchers or you like the quintuple launchers uh, the quintuple launchers I like in general just due to the fact that you have a much better, much tighter grouping on your torpedoes usually, and that allows you to really do some nasty aerial denial, uh, whether it's flushing a channel or whether it's denying a smoke screen to a destroyer, stuff like that. They're very good at that. They are very, very good at flushing out destroyers and smoke screens. Um, I loved it in my Fletchers. I love it in the, you know, this thing. It's just really good. You can see how how close those torpedoes are to one another. We did overlap them almost perfectly in that sense, just because, uh, I mean, you can see where they split up a little bit. Uh, now, I will say that they do tend to drift a little bit too far apart at the higher end of the scale. And you can see we've got some torpedoes ending up stacked on each other, which is something I don't particularly like because it just means that you're less likely to hit, you know, that torpedo. If you hit one, you might hit two, but usually, when you end up with torpedoes stacked on each other like we just did, you end up missing. I prefer to have a much wider spread overall um, instead of having them set like that. But that was my fault. That was just the way I launched that salvo. Uh, now we, we turn away from the Monarch. He's being a little unpredictable. I want to go over here. I thought this Iowa was going to die much quicker, which is why I didn't go for him initially. But uh, he's obviously hanging around. He's not dying. Uh, and leaving 16-inch armor piercing from these American battleships is just, you can't do it. So uh, I'm just going to go over here and ensure that he dies. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to launch torpedoes. And again, this is not a very good torpedo spread for me. But it's, it's difficult to launch torpedoes at somebody who's bow in. It's very difficult. And now we're pretty close to him. I mean, we're only 7 kilometers from, or well, we're not 7 kilometers from him. The torpedoes will take 7 kilometers to reach him. We're only five kilometers from five and a half. So uh, here's where I make my decision. A lot of people will probably get mad at me for this because I just launched torpedoes at him. And as soon as I put the smoke screen and start firing on him, he's gonna know that there's a torpedo boat here that wasn't here a minute ago. But I wanna just get these fires starting. I, I want him gone. I want him gone as quickly as possible. So we're just gonna try to set some fires. We do end up getting a fire, I believe on this salvo here, which is going to, uh, you know just get his attention and he does appear to be taking a torp on the bow which could cause flooding but it doesn't and i think what happened is he damaged con now that could have backfired on him and uh the reason i say it could have backfired on him is if his damage con had run out before that torp hit and he got flooded like that's gg that's game over you're done so keep that in mind you guys got to be a 
be paying attention to that sort of thing. I know I say it all the time, don't put out a single fire. And now we've got him on fire, he's dead. There's no way he survives this. It's just how long he survives until he dies. Uh, but he is dead. And so I start sailing away from him. And I tell, I tell my teammate that and he takes another shot at him anyway, which is whatever. The guy's dead, doesn't really matter to me one way or another if he lives and I get killed or not. So uh, we got our kill. We're at 36,000 damage done, and we're going to go over here, and we're going to put ourselves between the Monarch and the Sharnhorst. Sharnhorst is the further back to my right, and uh, the Monarch is to my left, as you can see we just looked at. We're going to sail basically right between them. Now, Monarch looks like he's about to eat a whole mess of torpedoes, and in fact, he does take three torpedoes, and that's all of his health gone. Now, those undoubtedly cause flooding, so we're going to be trying to set them on fire. Now, we've already used our smoke screens, so we don't have any way to hide. This is just us trying to stay alive, or trying to get a fire on him, while we know he just used his, his damage comp, we know he's using his heal, uh, so we're just trying to knock it out. And uh, we're just not getting any luck. <laughs> we're shattering a lot of rounds, even though we're trying to hit the superstructure. Uh, we are doing a little bit of damage. But uh, you can see we're close enough to the Sharn Horse now that I'm like, all right, we should be good. Sharn Horse is charging. He immediately turns hard to port, or it'd be hard to hit starboard, hard to, I have to turn to port. Um, and then I launch overlapping these. At this range, I thought there's no chance, especially after he just came off of that hard of a turn. However, he played it perfectly. I'll give him props. Like, he actually played me like a fiddle, and he's able to turn back in on himself and uh, only take a single torpedo which is impressive considering the wall of skill that I just laid in front of him. And uh, so props to the Sharn Horse there. That was well done by him. Unfortunately, doesn't really matter in the end because we take out the Monarch and down goes the team. So we had a pretty solid team effort there. And like I said, this ship is very adequate. It's not good. It's not bad. It's just a, it's a ship. It's serviceable. Pretty much anybody can do well in it and have average to, to good games. So, uh, yeah. It's not a bad ship, so if you like what I'm doing, punch the like button, leave a comment below, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and as always, I will see you in the next video.